It's so hard to show off in my studio lighting, but this is really pretty in purple. The folks at Republic Wireless are getting more serious about 5G on their plans, and they sent over a Moto Ace for me to test drive and share some thoughts. This segment of phones has been one of the most exciting to watch. Somewhere in that two to $400 territory, as daily driver communicator fare, we're seeing great tech trickle down with fewer and fewer compromises and more competition for premium features. This Moto feels immediately familiar. It's cut from a very similar cloth as phones like the TCL 10s or the Nord N10, and we're working a very similar parts list and build quality. Phones that are a little thicker, plastic backed, large screens, multi-camera rear modules, decent batteries, memory card slots, and headphone jacks. These phones make solid arguments and are often a more feature complete out of the box experience than more expensive fare. That can make the competition aspect a little trickier. Uh, these phones also feel fairly similar to each other and the differences between them can be very nuanced. A brief example, sure. A Nord N10 has a higher refresh rate display and faster charging. This Moto has slightly more powerful guts, might be a little bit better for gaming and has a larger battery. There is definitely still room here to pick and choose a flavor of this idea that better fits your needs, but like I said, those differences are probably going to be pretty small. The combination of good budget hardware and software helps set the phones apart a bit more. There's a consistency to Motorola's that I really like. Since the Moto X2 back in the day, counting on gestures to flick on a flashlight or fire up the camera, they just immediately come back. It's very familiar. And I kind of dig that. A Moto today just fits that vibe. It's also something I like about Sony phones. This is a mostly stock Android with a few little tweaks running on top. The last Moto I spent serious time with was the Moto G5. I cannot tell you how insanely better this crop of mid-ranger hardware is. We've got performance roughly in line with Snapdragon 845s, which is easily more than capable of handling high-level daily driver tasks. In years past, it was this class of phone where we would often complain about struggling to get through the UI or the choppiness or the jank. Now, it's not an issue doing light video editing on a phone that can capture pretty good 4K video. I think we're over that FUD, that fear, the uncertainty, the doubt, worrying about poor camera performance in this tier. There are pros and cons on all phone cameras, but performance here is solid. These pixel binning sensors have aged well over the last two years, and while I wouldn't count on these phones for complex video projects like I would a more premium device, this hardware is more than capable of some decent results. The casual point and shoot setup here, capturing some family memories, I'm not too worried about what this phone can deliver. Because I always get defensive of different camera setups because techies seem to be the most opinionated, but the real world practical differences are often a lot smaller than reviews make them out to be. Someone legit shopping around this price, they're going to get a feature rich camera with a good main sensor and solid video quality. Okay, the macro is kind of useless, but it's not impacting the price of this phone enough to be overly bothered when balanced against this humongous battery. No, seriously, judged as a daily driver communicator phone, this is easily two-day territory, and you could probably hypermile it out to three without too many concessions. But that brings us to the network chat. And this is an area that I'm really excited for consumers shopping at more accessible budgets. 5G is not real, so long as it's only available on upper mid-tier and higher devices. Like our transition to LTE back in the day, it doesn't hit that tipping point until we can pretty much take it for granted that all new phones are going to have these radios. When a Republic Wireless starts incorporating 5G and it's launched on a phone at 349, this is one of those releases where I feel we can start taking a new radio technology more seriously for all consumers. I think 5G in general has been oversold on the promise of 
amazing speed. But Sub-6 5G is an excellent solution for folks in more congested areas. Your speeds might not change dramatically when the 5G indicator flips on your phone, but a more stable connection, less interference, those are welcome benefits. Getting back to the Moto, I think it's fair to be concerned about upgrades and software support. It's likely these two to $400 devices probably won't get a lot of attention after a year. Not to dismiss those concerns, but the good thing about where we are today, Android 10 and moving forward, a little more of the security patching can be handled by Google Play services updates. So hopefully you're not left completely out in the cold after that first year. It's the critical balancing act to look at when we talk prices though. This Motorola is a lot more hardware than my little Pixel 4a. A bigger screen, much bigger battery, upgradable storage, two cameras, and support for that 5G radio. But this phone is the same price as a Pixel 4a. This helps us illustrate the different business models that manufacturers use, and it should help us set consumer expectations correctly. If you want all the hardware bells and whistles at the lowest possible price, you might face a compromise for longer term software support and vice versa. Techies have been bad at accounting for software as a feature or as a cost pretty much always. Software isn't free and software is not cheap. An informed consumer should be able to balance their needs against their budget, where the total package of a phone and phone service might make more sense for them. I'm currently on an MVNO and I've had very good experiences on Republic Wireless. I recently checked out their home adapter, which allows you to send your cell phone calls to landline style phones. They've been well ahead of the curve on Wi-Fi calling and number portability. It's a really fun service. This portfolio of more affordable but still decently powerful phones is growing well generally in North America and specifically on Republic Wireless. There are consumers who can't afford 50 bucks a month for two years or who might not qualify for a phone lease, or who might not want to hassle with buying a used or refurbished phone. Shopping sub $400, this used to be dicey territory, but this tier is a lot stronger now. I recently did a podcast with my wife talking about replacing her LG G7. She does not need more compute power than her old LG. She's not gaming on her phone. Her needs haven't changed over the last three years. If you're a techie watching a video like this, you might not fit into this category, but you definitely know someone who used to buy the most expensive phones just so they wouldn't be punished by a poor UI experience. That person today doesn't need to be buying premium tier anymore. For my wife and for a good chunk of my family, we're now playing a different game? Can we stay at the same tier of performance, but spend less every time we buy a new phone? It's a different kind of upgrade game, but it's a lot more fun for your wallet. I'll of course leave some links on the Moto One 5G Ace and what services Republic Wireless has to offer down in the description below. I think it's always worth doing a little comparison shopping to make sure you're getting the best deal you can. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel, supporting your favorite content creators, never been more critical than it is today. So I greatly appreciate those of you who are checking out the links down below. Maybe you're shopping a little merch. That kind of stuff really does help keep production rolling on this channel. You can catch a full list of all of my affiliates and partnerships on somegadgetguy.com, or you might consider, just maybe, joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This is basically the coolest collection of tech pals on the web, so I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at somegadgetguy on the Twitters and the Twitch and the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next review.